Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. We're coming to you today on Friday, August 28, 2020, with a special report on the Republican National Convention, which has taken place throughout this week, and it's uh, it's such a stark contrast to the Democratic National Convention that we reported on last week. We have a lot of exciting and encouraging information to share with you. Uh, many viewers have probably been watching the, the RNC throughout this week, so we're excited to report on it. Uh, uh, hello, Brian. I hope you're doing well this week, and I'm sure you've enjoyed all of this uh, wonderful things we've been seeing at the convention. Yes, it's been an extraordinary week, something, you know, I never thought I would see a U.S. political party do in my lifetime. Um, I, it's probably the, the first time I've watched through a whole political convention in decades. Uh, so again, I agree, we both agree this was really an extraordinary story, and maybe some of our readers didn't watch it all. So we're going to try to bring you in this uh, first news roundup of the week, a kind of uh, collage of reports of the whole themes of it. And then uh, we will also post a second weekly news roundup uh, that will cover a handful of stories about purely dedicated to directly the life of the church. So some stories that have gone in the church this week. So uh, we'll, we'll begin this first one, uh, which will be dedicated to the convention. And then please then watch the second one related to some other really uh, interesting stories from this week. Yes. So as viewers may know, uh, the Republican National Convention this year, similar to the, the Democratic National Convention, was held virtually. Or, I mean, the, a lot of the speeches were broadcast live, but not in front of the huge live audience that would normally be there uh, under normal circumstances. We're still under a lot of COVID coronavirus restrictions. Although so, there, there still was a contrast, although a lot of it was, was not to an audience. Every night there was at least one speech to a large crowd, the largest that's being, true. being last night. So I'd call it more of a, a hybrid. It was an, a, yeah. you know, kind of a hybrid, some live, some not. That's uh, true, yes. Again, it's interesting the, in terms of the whole reaction to COVID. The Catholic way is always the balanced way. Like we need to be prudent, don't just do stupid things, but that there's trade-offs and you don't just live your life in your basement out of fear, which really sums up the democratic one. There was, you saw nobody alive, really, nobody. Right. And where this, again, was balanced. Was, all the large crowds were outside, which, again, the most balanced scientific evidence is the safest place. The odds are very low when you're outside. Um, and again, it wasn't a, a, a socialist totalitarian lockdown. You saw some people in the crowds wearing masks if they were uncomfortable or, or worried, you know, wanted extra protection, they could do that. Yeah. But it wasn't a, you know, a, you didn't the key have a, is that they weren't forced to exactly, wear one. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Like Joe Biden wants to force us to wear one for the next three months, by the way. Yes. And lock down the country again. Again, he declared he would shut the country down for a year. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, <laughs> yes. we'll get to some of the positive things that have taken place um, throughout this week. So the convention started on Monday, August 24th. It ran through yesterday, uh, Thursday, August 27th. And to set the tone, as I was watching several of the speeches, I mean, there were many more speeches than, than either of us, yes. I'm sure, had time to watch all of them. There were numerous speakers but the ones that I was able to watch, uh, something struck me about the a recurring theme. And spiritually speaking, in my opinion, this election really boils down to either voting in favor of what Our Lady of Fatima called the, quote, errors of Russia, hmm. or voting against those errors. Um, as many I think of our, you're absolutely ahead. right. That, that Put aside all the other issues. This is, and a lot of people have compared it to the election in Italy, uh, that I wrote about in an article in Catholic Family News about Catholic voting. The uh, election in 1948 where Pius XII told Italian Catholics under pain of mortal sin they had to vote because one of the parties that was looked like they could win that election was the Italian Communist Party that was going to bring socialism to Italy. And he said, you know, again, he didn't say the opposition party was, you know, intricately Catholic and perfect, but he said the threat of communism and, and again, a lot of times people try to distinguish socialism and communism. They are two different terms for the same error. They are just two right. different approaches to implementing Marxism. Um, but right. he said, this is such a grave threat to Italy that, under, again, he told Italian Catholics under pain of mortal sin, you must vote 
to prevent the communists from coming in. And again, if we had a Pius XII in our day, would he be saying the same thing today? We can only speculate because we don't have a Pius XII. We have a pope that accepted- Put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. We have a pope that, that carried a crucifix shaped like a hammer and sickle. So uh, clearly not one that's worried about the, the error of the 20th century, as our lady told us. And, and again, putting aside, we're going to get into some details, but I agree with Matt. One of the major themes of this was to point out, this is not an election about Democrats or Republicans. It is an election of a communist party. The Democratic Party has essentially become a communist party, wanting to impose the errors of Russia. And that's what it's, it's about. And that theme came through really, really strongly. Um, the, the other theme I would like to mention that, that came through me watching this, there were politicians, but there were more people that were not politicians telling their story. And, and it really struck me, I, I think there was a real insight to Donald Trump, the person who, as we all admit, has got a lot of known public moral failings, right? But it says that something really came through in these stories uh, that is a, a very much, whether he knows it or not, a Catholic approach to the, the justice and mercy, right? This is something mm -hmm. in Catholic teaching. We need to be extremely firm and unflinching on principles of justice. Mm -hmm. But when dealing with people, and the situations they're in, we have to show mercy, right? Yes. And so, again, that's the Catholic teaching on everything. And it was on, also Catholic in the sense of universal. It was a very diverse yes. group of people. I, very much so. But, but that message really came through that, you know, that, again, in the Catholic sense, we are completely unflinching on, you know, the idea of homosexuality is completely intrinsically evil, can never be sanctioned. But to have compassion on people who have been lured into this lifestyle, have been deceived, and again, have some responsibility, but also to recognize they need help to get out of it. And we need to, mm -hmm. you know, have compassion on people. And that came old, It's kind of the old saying, you hate the sin, but you love, love the sinner. Love the sinner, exactly. Yeah. And that's, again, one thing that really struck me about this, um, you know, one of the things that, another theme that came through was law and order, right? That we need to get control of our streets back. We have to stop the violence. We have to respect the law. But then Which is exploding uh, and it's renewed in the state of Wisconsin. It's literally it burning. It's terrible. Literally. But that was interspersed with some really incredible stories. Uh, and so this one woman uh, that President Trump became aware of, that under the Biden criminal justice reform, under the Clinton administration in the 1990s, was put into prison, federal prison, life plus 20, for a nonviolent drug offense. And he found out about this, and the woman had had a conversion. Again, I don't know to what, maybe Protestantism, but it turned her life around in prison, was doing incredible things. And this came to President Trump's attention, and he said, this is wrong. This law is wrong. This is unjust. I mean, she did her time. It was, again, it was very clear. It was a nonviolent drug offense. Right. She admitted she was wrong, but she'd been in prison for decades, was still going to be there for the rest of her right. life. He commuted her sentence. Um, another little story, there was a gentleman who had been in prison for bank robbery, had served yep. his time, got out, yep. and turned his life around, founded a program for uh, Helping convicts. Helping inmates trans, uh, transition back into society. Yeah. Right, by earning a high school diploma. And first of all, President Trump went to the graduation. He was invited. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be there for five minutes. He stayed over an hour and met yep. each of the, these people, former prisoners, most of whom were minorities. Uh, gave them their diplomas, talked to them. And then live on TV this week, he gave a presidential pardon uh, yep. to this gentleman. Again, I did see that. And again, this is this balance. Justice, the guy served his time. Uh, he upheld justice. He didn't excuse him and say, well, okay, well, you're, you know, but he didn't excuse in that sense. But then also showing this mercy that people can be redeemed. People can turn their yes. life around. And again, that, I don't know if he even knows that's a Catholic concept, but you can't, fake this stuff i mean this this was real real people telling these stories right um and, and it really came through that that was of striking me the theme that we we're going to be firm on principles as you're going to see in these stories unflinching on the on protection of the unborn but a real compassion for real people uh it, 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 it's really funny watching it i thought a lot about my, my deceased grandfather because again they're about he's a little bit a little old he would be a little older for alive but he kind of some of the things donald trump did reminded me of my grandfather because he was again he was a very unflinching person i remember my when i was little my grand my uncle was away at liberal college and brought an atheist home to thanksgiving dinner Oh my. <laughs> and the atheist said, well, I'm not saying grace. And my grandfather looked up, Irish grandfather said, you don't say grace, 
you don't eat, get out. <laughs> like he was, he was, he was a tough guy, but he was very much like if he found somebody was in trouble or, you know, needed something or was down on their luck, he was like the first person, let me help you. What can I do? And it was really mm-hmm. fun. Again, for what we can see, that seems to be the personality of Donald Trump. Uh, just kind yes. of a person when he hears about a real person in a real situation says, well, what can I do? How can I help this person? Yes. And again, that to these clips, that necessarily is not going to come through. But if you watch the whole thing, uh, that was a, a real recurring theme. Definitely. So, so in addition to the, uh, the theme of voting either in favor of or against the errors of Russia, something else that's, that uh, came to mind is definitely Archbishop Vigano's yes. historic letter to President Trump, in which he says at the beginning, quote, In recent months, we have been witnessing the formation of two opposing sides that I would call biblical. And we see this throughout the the Republican National Convention. Mention is made of there's clearly a very stark contrast between the choices available to us in this election. So Archbishop Vigano refers to them as the children of light and the children of darkness. As we reported last week about the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, Interestingly, Biden and others tried to commandeer that language, uh, referring to themselves basically as children of light or representatives of the light. And really what what comes to mind in that context is the, uh, there's a verse in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it is, where St. Paul talks about that even Satan can transform himself into an angel of light, you know, pretending to be an agent of light, whereas he is actually the prince of darkness. So very stark contrast. It's a very, uh, you know, for Catholics who are serious about the faith, I think it's a pretty easy decision to make as as far as how to cast your vote, but uh, I think our reporting will just confirm that for you. So as we get into our coverage of the convention itself, I wanted to briefly revisit President Trump's State of the Union address from back in February, and it just struck me, man, February of this year seems like at least a year ago, if not more. This has been such a crazy year. Yeah. Um, so, but during that speech, President Trump said, quote, socialism destroys nations, but always remember freedom unifies the soul. Wow. That's a, pr- that's a profound quote. Yes. Uh, when's the last time we would have heard something like that? Probably President Ronald Reagan, I'm guessing. <clears throat> yes. And he also said during that same speech, quote, 132 lawmakers in this room have endorsed legislation to impose a socialist takeover of our healthcare system, wiping out the private health insurance plans of 180 million very happy Americans. To those watching at home tonight, I want you to know we will never let socialism destroy American healthcare words from uh, President Trump's State of the Union address back in February. I also wanted to just mention as we, in light of the theme of voting in favor of or against the errors of Russia, we, obviously we need to, uh, that's in the context of Our Lady's Fatima message, and we should also recall that Sister Lucia of Fatima, the eldest of the child seers, the one who lived a full life, uh, she warned Uh, back in the 40s, actually, that without the consecration of Russia, every nation on earth will eventually fall to communism. And I see President Trump in some way, I don't know exactly how this is going to play out in God's providence, but he seems to be a a bulwark somehow kind of holding back the, the flood or the deluge of communism in some way. I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but that's my take. Clearly, he can't consecrate Russia, right? So he's not going to be the ultimate answer. But if he can hold back that chastisement, uh, give us more time for a pope who would do it, then, you know, that's a good thing. So again, no one's saying he's the ultimate answer. Obviously, only the consecration of Russia will do that. But the question is, can we buy ourselves some more time for a pope who will answer Our Lady's call? Yes. So on that note, uh, we're going to go through several clips now, uh, video clips from the convention where the theme of freedom versus socialism is really prominent um, throughout these these video clips. We're going to start with one by a former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley. She was also a former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. And in this clip, she's ta- it's coming, uh, she was 
just before the clip starts, she was talking about uh, when she was governor of South Carolina and some of the obstacles that she had to face uh, during the Obama Biden years and how they thankfully were able to, she was able to stand up to the, to their um, kind of tyrannical um, measures that they were trying to impose to, to limit the opening of business and such. So now she goes on to describe how much worse it would be under a Biden uh, Harris administration. Biden Harris administration would be much, much worse. Last time, Joe's boss was Obama. This time, it would be Pelosi, Sanders, and the squad. Their vision for America is socialism, and we know that socialism has failed everywhere. They want to tell Americans how to live and what to think. They want a government takeover of health care. They want to ban fracking and kill millions of jobs. They want massive tax hikes on working families. Joe Biden and the socialist left would be a disaster for our economy. But President Trump is leading a new era of opportunity. So again, the theme, this is not about specific policies. This is about a choice between uh, socialism and something else. Again, what, whatever you want to call it, but something that is opposed to uh, socialism. Right. Go ahead. And, and then I was going to say, and then that theme uh, also uh, was seconded or, or heard again from uh, Melania Trump. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. She's someone who has uh, been abused more by the liberal media, even than Donald Trump, I think. Uh, it's interesting. One story uh, this week, she, uh, the, one of the events was held in the Rose Garden of the White House. And she apparently had led, as many first ladies have done, renovations, you know, Jackie Kennedy one renovated the whole White House, but led a renovation plan to apparently renovate the, the Rose Garden, which hadn't had a, you know, an updating or, a, you know, a renovation in, I think, 70 years. So she did this and it was unveiled the night of her speech. And there was a tweet uh, that went out that was caused a lot of scandal that said, uh, how dare she change the Rose Garden? She's only a foreigner. Mm. And again, we got it, it was removed and taken down, uh, but it was uh, one of these liberal, uh, it was a, a New York Times reporter that said it. And again, this is just the hypocrisy of the left. Oh, we love immigrants. Well, Melania Trump is a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. She's not an illegal immigrant. She's a U.S. citizen who became a U.S. citizen. And again, it just shows their hypocrisy. After years of waiting and going through the process. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But she's dismissed as a foreigner. She shouldn't be touching our Rose Garden. She's only a foreigner. Uh, again, just exposes the hypocrisy. But in any event, here she is speaking from, uh, from the Rose Garden. And again, a little clip of her speech that also uh, hit on the same theme. Growing up as a young child in Slovenia, which was under communist rule at the time, I always heard about an amazing place called America a land that stood for freedom and opportunity. As I grew older, it became my goal to move to the United States and follow my dream of working in the fashion industry. And again, she's not, and we're going to see this theme emerged also in some other talks, she's not just talking theoretically, right? She, again, she, this woman grew up in a communist country in the Eastern yes. Bloc. And again, she said, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's almost, uh, you know, like, um, I think it was that, that Ronald Reagan debate with Walter Mondale, where Ronald Reagan said something about John Kennedy, and I think it was Mondale. He said, uh, you know, I know John Kennedy. John Kennedy is my friend. You don't know what you're talking about, he tried to say to Reagan. Right. You know, it's just what she's saying. She's like, you're wanting socialism in this country? I know what socialism is, right? I right. lived it. And like uh, our, uh, Bishop Schneider, uh, who also escaped, she said, I yes. escaped from it. And whatever flaws there are in our country, which are great, our country in communist countries is always seen as a place to, to get away, right? Even if it right. wasn't perfect, which it isn't. And they've got a lot of liberal flaws in our country, but it was not communist. And, and right. that, that, that was an important message that we saw uh, that, that she hit on from her, her own personal experience. Yes, another gentleman who spoke uh, gave a, a brief speech that was very, I mean, his English yes. isn't the greatest, 
but his message is amazing and his life story is amazing. Uh, yeah, so and I, I actually had that teed up. I, I think okay. it's worth worth playing um, okay. because again, China has been an incredible part of this uh, election discussion. This election. Uh, so just to give, I just wanted to give a little background yeah. about the man, just to so folks know he's a Chinese human rights activist and a, actually a political refugee. His name is Chen Guang Cheng. Yes. And he's a man who knows firsthand, again, like Melania Trump, but even more so, the, the, the evils of communism and specifically the Chinese Communist Party. Yes. He spoke out, as he says in his speech, he spoke out against China's tyrannical, evil, one-child-only policy. He was arrested. He was beaten. His family was, was menaced by the, the Communist Party. So we'll play that clip and... Yes, and again, it's really important because he uh, is going to show that. Again, what did the? And this is both Republicans and Democrats. This is George Bush. This is have sanitized communist China, and they try. You notice they always talk about it as is China. They've tried to get us to forget that it's a communist country. Right. Um, and again, this he is is from someone who lived it, telling us the communist China, the Chinese Communist Party is a Marxist, and they are dangerous. And he also, before I play the clip brings through the two themes we're going to show were highlighted, fighting communism and defending life. Because as Matt said, he's going to talk about the one-child policy, which was enforced by forced abortions. So here is this gentleman who is a, a, a blind, as you can see, obviously lawyer. Uh, and I don't know whether he went blind. Well, he's blind from birth. I couldn't he find was, out. I think he went blind in, in early childhood when he was like five yes. months old. He had some kind of an illness. So basically all of his life. Yes. Uh, again, somebody who under Marxism is a throwaway. They're not good for the collective. Uh, right. So here is this, again, powerful, powerful testimony. Greetings. My name is Chen Guangcheng. Standing up to tyranny is not easy. I know. When I spoke out against China's one-child policy and other injustices, I was prosecuted beaten, sent to prison, and put under house arrest by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. In April 2005, 2012, I escaped and was given shelter in the American Embassy in Beijing. I'm forever grateful to the American people for welcoming me and my family to the United States, where we are now free. Again, in his own words, he says it so much better than Matt or I could. Yes. Uh, and this is the country that Joe Biden said, come on, man, they're not that, that bad. They're not going right. to eat our lunch. And again, this is this man saying he was beaten. He was tortured. Why? Actually, I think later in his speech, he yes. says um, that the, he refers to the CCP as the enemy of humanity. Yes. So very strong language. And again, why was he tortured? Because he opposed forced sterilization abortions uh, on the Chinese people. The, One of the, the principal errors, errors of Russia. Exactly, exactly. Um, there was nobody at the Democratic National Convention talking about the, you know, the oppression of, of China. Right. Yes, so our next clip is going to feature uh, um, footage from Vice President Mike Pence's acceptance speech, which I think was given at, outside of Fort McKinley, I believe that's Yes, where it McHenry, was. Fort McHenry. I thought, McHenry, yes. Where the national anthem was composed during the battle, uh, the uh, battle of the War of 1812. Yes. One thing I noted, this isn't in the clip we're going to play, but uh, when he actually accepted the formally accepted the nomination, he did say it was by the grace of God. So that was nice to hear. Yes. He was accepting that nomination by the grace of God. In this clip, the theme again is opposition to socialism. He makes it, it again, it brings back to mind uh, Archbishop Vigano's letter about the children of light versus the children of darkness, two opposing camps. It actually is very Ignatian in that sense. Uh, in yes. The spiritual exercises, the two standards. Yes. In this election, it's not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. 
It's whether we will leave to our children and our grandchildren a country grounded in our highest ideals of freedom, free markets, and the unalienable right to life and liberty, or whether we will leave them a country that's fundamentally transformed into something else. We stand at a crossroads, America. President Trump has set our nation on a path of freedom and opportunity. Joe Biden would set America on a path of socialism and decline. Again, another another clear uh, clear example of setting. This is not. And it was either it was very Catholic in thinking, and again, maybe unwittingly, he first before that clip went through. We you know here are these, the economy, different things, very you know temporal things. But then again, which our Catholic teaching always says, yes, that's important, that we need to have a, a basic material well-being before we can devote ourselves to higher things, right? If you're starving, it's hard to, uh, and that's why the missionaries knew this, if you're starving, it's hard to you know, teach people about the faith when they're worried about just being alive. Right. But that's always a means to something higher. And I noticed that transition. He talked about those sort of temporal things. He said, but you know, beyond these, there's something greater at stake here than just, yes. you know, social security, unemployment payments, things like that. Uh, and that de definitely, as we, as you're seeing, was the theme of this uh, four nights, was that this is, we are a not- It's a battle of worldviews, really. A battle of worldviews. And as we said last week, it's not just that I'm pro-life, which, which is, again, is important, but I'm against- the other side. I'm against abortion. And that message is very clear here on both of those fronts. Yes. The next couple of clips we're going to play, I would say, deal specifically with cultural Marxism, which has become yes. a huge problem in our country. And I say that as spe with specifically within mind, I have specifically in mind the, the uh, tactic of the communists of Marxists to use propaganda uh, in the mainstream media in this country has basically become a vehicle for cultural Marxism on, in many ways. So this first clip we're going to play in that regard is of a, a young man named Daniel Cameron, who is the Attorney General of Kentucky. He's actually only 34 years old. He's a year younger than I am. And he's, that's the highest legal office in a state, if I'm not mistaken, correct? So a very yes. accomplished uh, African-American young man. And he has some great, got a great sense of humor. I really enjoyed his speech. He's got some very hard hitting uh, words for specifically aimed at Joe Biden and some comments that Biden has made in the past. I think often about my ancestors who struggled for freedom. And as I think of those giants and their broad shoulders, I also think about Joe Biden who says, if you aren't voting for me, you ain't black. Who argued that Republicans would put us back in chains, who says there is no diversity of thought in the black community. Mr. Vice President, look at me. I am black. We are not all the same, sir. I am not in chains. My mind is my own. And you can't tell me how to vote because of the color of my skin. Joe Biden is a backwards thinker in a world that is craving forward-looking leadership. There's no wisdom in his record or plan, just a trail of discredited ideas. And again, this is a, a theme, uh, the hypocrisy of liberalism that we've talked about for so long, right? That they, uh, and then it's a tool of communism, right? From the communist manifesto forward. It was an appeal to people who were suffering injustice, holding out a false promise. And that's what, we, what uh, Pius XI called communism, a false promise that we are gonna make your life better. But all they're doing is luring you in to support the revolution with promises of a distant future, right? Remember, communism structure is set up by Marx and then Lenin. The idea is you have the poor people, the, the, the proletariat. You have this revolution that installs a dictatorship, the dictatorship of the proletariat that is an oppressive communist regime that we've seen in the 20th century. And why should people endure this totalitarian repression? Because sometime in the future, we're going to get to this panacea of everybody's going to have the free food and free everything, which they never get to. And it is just a way to trick people uh, into supporting us. We're looking out for you and all we're really doing is oppressing you. And again, to this young man's credit, that's what he's pointing out. He's saying, look, your false promises to my community for all these years uh, to lure us to vote for you, to advance your communist agenda, you know, I've seen through it. I've seen through these 
these false promises and your hypocrisy, right? Your hypocrisy. I mean, that's cool. When I, I had to watch the clip three times when I saw Joe Biden say it, right? If you're, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Like he actually said those words, those yes. exact words. Exact words. And again, what's more racist? I know what you have to think because you're black. I mean, that's the most racist comment. Uh, right. And his other statement was true that this gentleman said, he said, there's no diversity in the black community. All black people are alike. Wow. I mean, those were arguments that slave supporting people said in the 19th century. Oh, all black are this way. That's why they're fit to be slaves. I mean, right. that's extraordinary that you see this, this tool of communism to get people to enter into an unholy bargain uh, that is just so hypocritical. Right. So the other example of cultural Marxism that we want to highlight or a stand against cultural Marxism was another brave young man who we've uh, reported on in the past. His name is Nicholas Sandman, the teenager who was defamed terribly by the mainstream media after the incident at the Lincoln Memorial in January of 2019, after the March for Life last year. So this is the young man who who very respectfully but firmly stood his ground when the the Native American activist and agitator, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, but um, was basically banging a tribal drum in this kid's face. And this was after the, the high school students, his friends had been harassed by this other extremist group, the Black mm -hmm. Hebrew Israelites. And so, yeah, we're going to play this clip. And yes, Mr. here Sandman, he is. Sorry, he was just yeah, he's back at the Lincoln um, Memorial where this happened to tell his story. Yes. So he's basically testifying to the importance based on after he tells his story, he's imploring, he's exhorting the American people to rally behind President Trump, um, who is willing to stand up to what President Trump frequently calls the fake news media. And really, it's communist uh, propaganda is what it actually is. In November... I believe this country must unite around a president who calls the media out and refuses to allow them to create a narrative instead of reporting the facts. I believe we must join a president who will challenge the media to return to objective journalism. And together, I believe we must all embrace our First Amendment rights and not hide in fear of the media or from the tech companies or from the outrage mob either. This is worth fighting for. This, and again, this is another playbook out of the uh, page out of the playbook of the communists, right? George Orwell's 1984 shows it to us uh, to control thought, to control the media. Uh, and uh, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and the official Soviet uh, news agency was called Pravda which mm -hmm. means truth in, in Russian. <laughs> and it was right out of George Orwell, where the something that's called is the opposite of what it is. So in George Orwell, yeah. the Ministry of Truth is the place that puts out false lies and propaganda. And that's exactly what Pravda was. It was just false information to lie to people and to deceive people. Um, and um, that's exactly what you know that happened to this man, the false media, the Pravda of the Communist Party of the United States, the Democrats, attacked this man, distorted the story, uh, made it out to be something it wasn't. Uh, and this young man stood up. Portrayed only, like, him to be the aggressor, basically, yes, when he was actually the innocent the bystander. Victim, right. And then he stood up and he stood up afterwards and he sued the media. Uh, and he, as we reported, recently received a settlement for their vicious attack on him. So... Uh, again, highlighting another person willing to stand up against uh, the other technique of Marxism, which is to control thought, control information, and to put forward false information. Yes. Um, then now that brings us to really another incredible speaker that huge contrast um, with the Democratic Convention, which was the most pro-abortion convention and, and positions ever. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, invited, again, in terms of non politicians, as you see, uh, Abby Johnson, who many of you may know, uh, had a movie, a book written and a, a movie called Unplanned that came out a couple years ago, telling her story. She was a woman who was a Planned Parenthood director, received the uh, uh, um, Director Employee of the Year Award from Planned Parenthood. The Margaret Sanger Award. The Margaret, yes, yes the Sa Margaret Sanger Award. Uh, and she had a conversion experience. She uh, witnessed an abortion she's going to talk about in this speech and she left 
uh, Planned Parenthood and became a pro-life, first a pro-life advocate and got sued by Planned Parenthood and, and fought them, then converted to Catholicism and is reported by LifeSite News, most recently is now going to traditional Latin mass. So an incredible story of conversion, redemption, uh, and she is a, an incredible voice for uh, the sanctity of human life, uh, the mm -hmm. preservation of human life, the first principle of the natural law. And uh, just going to play two clips uh, from, her, from her speech. So here first is a little bit about, about Planned Parenthood, the facts that the news media doesn't want people to know. I truly believed I was helping women, but things drastically changed in 2009. In April, I was awarded Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award and invited to their annual gala where they present the Margaret Sanger Award, named for their founder. And Margaret Sanger was a racist who believed in eugenics. Her goal when founding Planned Parenthood was to eradicate the minority population. Today, almost 80% of Planned Parenthood abortion facilities are strategically located in minority neighborhoods. And every year, Planned Parenthood celebrates its racist roots by presenting the Margaret Sanger Award. Later in August, my supervisor assigned me a new quota to meet, an abortion quota. I was expected to sell double the abortions performed the previous year. When I pushed back, underscoring Planned Parenthood's public-facing goal of decreasing abortions, I was reprimanded and told, abortion is how we make our money. Again. A lot of people don't know this. Catholic Family News reported on Margaret Sanger and their ties to Planned Parenthood many, many times in the past. Uh, but this, what she's saying is very true. Planned Parenthood, first of all, was called uh, the National Eugenics Society, is originally named. Uh, mm -hmm. But when eugenics got, a, got bad press after World War II and the Nazis, they changed their name to Planned Parenthood. It sounded more anodyne, right? It sounded less what it was. But very, very true. Margaret Sanger's whole approach was to put abortion clinics in the minority neighborhoods to eliminate, to commit genocide against those populations. And it's, it's true, the facts she said are true. They are targeted. Uh, and that, that remains their policy to this day. It remains their policy to this day. That is their goal, that are their goal, along with making money, as she said, in, right. while they're doing it. All the um, while pretending to help minorities. Exactly. Again, this is the communist uh, lie that they are an arm of an error of Russia. Now, interestingly, I read, and I don't know, it, it's interesting, they have now renamed the Margaret Sanger Award they just announced. <laughs> so they got caught in the cookie jar, and all of a sudden they're, oh, oh, wait, 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 yeah, we've done this for 70 years or whatever. Now, now they're apparently going to change the name of the award. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a guilty reaction uh, to me. Yeah. I don't know about to you. Definitely. But uh, we do want to play one second uh, clip from her speech because in addition to telling her, her incredible personal story and being an insider telling us what really happened at Planned Parenthood, what they're all about, mm -hmm. she then goes through uh, President Donald Trump's record on the cause that she has dedicated her life to uh, ending uh, abortion. Uh, because again, in the past, there are other Republicans who, you know, George Bush uh, among them, who came and said, oh, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life, and then got elected and didn't do anything. Didn't even show up at the March for Life. Didn't do any real practical things. Ronald Reagan probably did a little, I mean, more than others, but even him, again, and he was not unqualified. He supported abortion in limited cases, rape, incest. So again, we have never really seen a candidate you could say 100% is. And here's Abby Johnson's case for the, the, the we have one now. And I now support President Trump because he has done more for the unborn than any other president. During his first month in office, he banned federal funds for global health groups that promote abortion. That same year, he overturned an Obama-Biden rule that allowed government subsidy of abortion. He appointed a record number of pro-life judges, including two Supreme Court justices. And importantly, he announced a new rule protecting the rights of healthcare workers objecting to abortion, many of whom I work with every day. 
Life is a core tenant of who we are as Americans. And this election is a choice between two radical anti-life activists and the most pro-life president we have ever had. Again, facts. They're, they're not just promises, but, but facts. Again, we only can do, you know, again, another Catholic principle, God only expects us to do what's within our power, right? The President of the United States cannot end abortion by himself. Uh, in our system, you know, we need the Supreme Court to overturn its erroneous ruling in Roe v. Wade. The President can't do that. It's impossible. But there are certain things he can do to work towards that. And what she's pointing out is he's done that. He said, okay, well, we, we have to get, first of all, get justices on there who are going to recognize this immoral law that's no law at all and tear it apart. But two, in the interim, stop, stop it as much as you can and take away funding, uh, allow doctors and nurses to not have to be forced to, against the natural law. Seems kind of obvious. Yes. Uh, but again, she gives all those examples. And again, the contrast is against a ticket that wants to allow abortion and even infanticide for abortions that go wrong, uh, right up until and during and after birth. And a woman who persecuted Daniel DeLauden, who went to fight abortion by exposing their criminal activity. Uh, that's, you know, a, a, you can't have a more stark choice. And again, I admit in 2016, I was skeptical. Okay, Donald Trump, he's made some things, statements in the past that he was not that opposed to abortion. He's saying he is now okay, maybe take a chance, see, maybe he's telling the truth. But this is a different situation. Here, we now have four years where he had a chance to do something. And as Abby Johnson rattled off, and she didn't mention him actually coming to the March for Life, the first president, but those specific actions he did. And notice many of them are overturning things that Joe Biden and President Obama did. Yes. So before we get to President Trump himself, we have one more spectacular speaker to share with you. Many of you have probably seen her in the news, uh, the coverage of her speech. Sister Deidre, she goes by the nickname Dee Dee uh, Byrne, I think, Byrne. Byrne, yes. yeah. She is a, has an incredible story uh, uh, as well. She was, she's actually served for, I think she said, what, 29 years in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. She retired at the rank of Colonel. She's a medical doctor and a surgeon, and she's currently the superior of the D.C. area Little Workers of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. She's, a, she's an actual nun in full habit, unlike the so-called nun that the Democrats had speak at their convention. We'll get to her in just a few minutes. But we have to play this outstanding clip uh, from the end of her speech, ta also talking about President Trump's pro-life record. Again, I was blown away. And many people say this is just an image or a symbol. And that's what, obviously, a convention's about. But as Catholics, we know symbols mean things, right? Images right. mean things. And, you know, whatever, I don't know anything much about this, none other than the few details that are in the press. But can you imagine a country like ours that is not founded as a Catholic country, that has been anti-Catholic for much of its history, right? Uh, to see a nun in full length habit, full wielding a rosary, as you're going to see in a minute, yes. is a first in American history. And again, it is a symbol. It's not, you know, she's not running for office. She's not a politician. But the symbols that somebody chooses to use uh, tell you a lot. Uh, yes. So here's the, uh, I think it's the very end of her speech. Yes. Donald Trump is the most pro-life president that this nation has ever had, defending life at all stages. His belief in the sanctity of life transcends politics. President Trump will stand up against Biden Harris, who are the most anti-life presidential ticket ever, even supporting the horrors of late term abortion and infanticide. Because of his courage and conviction, President Trump has earned the support of America's pro-life community. Moreover, he has a nationwide of religious standing behind him. You'll find us here with our weapon of choice, the rosary. So thank you, Mr. President. We are all praying for you. And again, she- I love that weapon of choice. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Uh, exactly, exactly. And, and, and again, is she, you know, none who goes to traditional mass? I doubt it. I don't know. I doubt it. But 
what is she is clearly not part of the deep church <laughs> you know? right. clearly not she's not part of the deep church she's not afraid to hold up her rosary and and turn to again what did our lady tell the children of fatima the rosary and the scapular right these are your uh, these are our two weapons yeah. and as matt said uh this sister sister just this this speech unabashedly understanding the teaching of the church contrasts with a tale of two nuns another nun that matt's going to tell us about yes so last week uh, the democratic national convention featured two very controversial speakers so-called catholic speakers one of them of course was father james martin who led a prayer and uh, the other was Sister Simone Campbell, who I'm going to. LifeSite News has an excellent report about this. That the headline reads: "This was published last week, Friday." Nun who led prayers at Dem National Convention, abortion issue quote above my pay grade. I mean that really says it all. So this is the the LifeSite News report: A nun who led prayers at the recent Democratic National Convention has told Catholic media that the question of whether abortion should be opposed is above her pay grade. Catholic News Agency reports that in response to being asked whether her organization opposes the legal protection of abortion, Sister Simone Campbell responded, quote, that is not our issue. That is not it. It is above my pay grade, end quote. Well, fortunately, it's not above Sister Deirdre Burns pay grade because right. <laughs> she actually has some catechism in it, I guess it seems like. Yes. I mean, I what a want, contrast. I just wanted to read briefly because she did more than offer a prayer at the DNC. I actually have the transcript of what she said, this Sister Simone, uh, last week at the, the DNC. She said, good evening. I'm Sister Simone Campbell, Executive Director of Network and Leader of Nuns on the Bus. So speaking of cultural yeah. Marxism, <laughs> yes. there's what she says. Tonight marks an important next chapter in our story of who we will become as a nation. So clearly she buys into this worldview yes. that she wants to, as I think Obama put it, fundamentally transform America into something else. Yes. So she goes on, quote, so I speak to you with a sense of urgency and hope. Hope in what? I don't know knowing the difficult work ahead grounded in my faith yeah like joe biden's grounded in his faith right on well, my faith which is not the faith of the catholic church <laughs> right and tellingly instead of obviously instead of holding up a rosary the the, the references she makes to so-called faith are the three abrahamic traditions uh, she she refers to god as O oh, divine spirit I mean, that could easily be a Native American shaman saying yes. something like that. Well, and, and I was, nuns on the bus, and I get John Venari, our, our predecessor, did a story on that many years ago, uh, is basically the Antifa of the liberal nuns. There are these nuns that go around pub professionally protesting on buses uh, for things like pro-choice causes and other of uh, the uh, liberal agenda to remake the church. Right. So again, symbols matter. These are, you know, these contrast of two nuns between the two conventions says it all. Uh, so getting towards the end of our coverage, uh, after that powerful image, we get to the uh, acceptance speech of uh, the President of the United States that occurred last night from the White House lawn. Uh, and we want to play two, I think, two telling clips. It was a very long speech, as you can see, uh, it was, I think, an hour, this whole part. It was around 70 minutes long yeah. total. A little bit, a little over an hour. Uh, but we just want to play two clips that highlight, again, many of the things he talked about, uh, are, are, they're diverse, but highlight the two really key issues we've been talking about. And then it's not just people supporting him, but he is on board with these. Joe Biden claims he has empathy for the vulnerable, yet the party he leads supports the extreme late term abortion of defenseless babies right up until the moment of birth. Democrat leaders talk about moral decency, but they have no problem with stopping a baby's beating heart in the ninth month of pregnancy. Democrat politicians refuse to protect innocent life, and then they lecture us about morality and saving America's soul. Tonight, we proudly declare that all children born and unborn 
have a God-given right to life. And again, there you have it from his own mouth. And again, it's important, although he emphasized the horror of late-term abortion, which is even more horrific, he made very clear there that he's not just talking about that, right? That he, the right of all children, born and unborn. I also so, loved how he highlighted the hypocrisy of the left trying to yes. lecture everyone about morality when they have no problem violating one of the most, fund if probably the most fundamental <laughs> principle of the natural law. Well, and again, it's always the first principle because without life, you cannot pursue any of the other goods of the natural law if you're dead, right? Exactly. So that's why it is the most fundamental. Um, and, you know, again, he's really showing out black lives matter unless you're actually a black baby that's not born yet. Then you don't right. matter, right? Exactly. Um, and again, one more clip uh, from, I think it's a little later, yeah, a little later in, in his speech. During the Democrat convention, the words under God were removed from the Pledge of Allegiance. Not once, but twice. We will never do that. But the fact is, this is where they're coming from. Like it or not, this is where they're coming from. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs. And again, this was the one time I was thinking about my grandfather, because again, he, I told you a little bit about him, right? You don't say grace, you don't eat. And he was always very, you know, if he were alive today and heard someone taking it under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, he would have blown his top. <laughs> right. He, you know, he fought in World War II. And, and again, the point here is these are symbols, right? It is a, a, a symbol to say one nation under God. Right. Uh, but the symbols mean something, right? It's why uh, Catholic states who wrote constitutions would start their constitution by acknowledging the sovereignty of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ as king of their country. Uh, right. Incredibly, you know, important. It, it's meaningful, those symbols. And if, if we and, continue in that clip, there's a great quote about uh, Joe Biden being a Trojan horse for socialism. If we yes, can so do you want to continue? Bit. Continue yeah. a little bit? Just sure. a little bit further. Confiscate your guns and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. If Joe Biden doesn't have the strength to stand up to wild-eyed Marxists like Bernie Sanders and his fellow radicals, and there are many, there are many, many, we see them all the time, it's incredible actually, then how is he ever going to stand up for you? He's not. Yeah. And, you know, again, why the Pope supposed communism? Because it's errors. And they always said it is against God. It is against religion. Communism has to destroy religion as part of its tenets. Yes. And, and that's why, again, he's making this connection. It's not a coincidence, I think, that he said that right after talking about removing under God. Because what exactly. do communist socialists do? They rip God out of public life. Um, and again, some of our readers may not know that it was actually a Catholic that fought because the originally the Pledge of Allegiance didn't have the words under God in the first version that was used. But it was actually a Catholic that worked. And one of his mission was to get that phrase added uh, in the okay. 20th century to to the Pledge of Allegiance. And now they want to rip God out of public life like all Marxists before them. Yes. Uh, so extraordinary themes there. Again, this theme, the anti-communism theme, the theme that the Second Vatican Council wouldn't touch, uh, the incredibly strong pro-life theme in terms of, and the anti-abortion, let's call it what it is, the anti-abortion theme, yes. uh, the end to abortion theme. Uh, the, again, the respect paid to religion and specifically not to all religions, but, but to, to Christ and to Christianity. Um, again, Donald Trump is not a, not a Catholic. We don't know where, I don't know where he's evolved in his, his spiritual life. It's, it's going in a good direction, uh, but he doesn't, he's not known as a Catholic. He hasn't told us he's converted, uh, but uh, he is certainly promoting the Catholic cause against the errors of Russia. And, and as I said, symbols matter. So we do want to play one final video. After the president's speech last night, there were big fireworks display and then entertainment I mean, something we've talked a lot about at Catholic Family News, the entertainment you choose, the music you choose says a lot about your soul, right? Music is a direct mm -hmm. link to the soul, um, as, as a great philosopher said. And so again, cho these choices matter. Uh, and so the 
Uh, after the speech, this uh, a gentleman, I don't know, an opera singer he appears to be, came out and sang a few songs, a few patriotic songs, but he also sang this song. I just want to play a little clip uh, because I think this is a first in American history. And I'm sure our viewers recognize that it's the Hail Mary set to uh, to music uh, by by the composer Schubert. And again, I was taken aback. I was blown away. You can ask my, my wife. I was like, I, I can't believe this. Because again, knowing American history, it is a country which has been extremely anti-Catholic, as many anti-Catholic presidents. Uh, the Basilica in the town I grew up, Philadelphia, uh, had to have, you ever go there, the windows are built only on the second floor uh, because there were so many rocks thrown through the window during its construction by the anti-Catholic parties that uh, they have said, we can't build windows because they're just keep getting broken. Right. Uh, to have the Hail Mary publicly proclaimed from the balcony of the White House in front of a sitting president, again, I, I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> I, I would be surprised if, again, if somebody could show that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it doesn't prove, I'm not saying, oh, Donald Trump's a Catholic. He's, but we can certainly hope and pray. We that can hope and pray that, that yeah. he does, but still, that he would have this prayer. Uh, and then thinking back to what Matt said in the beginning, Archbishop Vigano, this is not about an election. This is about the the forces of darkness, communism, the children of light that follow whom our Lady, and to have this final night of the convention capped with the singing of Ave Maria. <laughs> From the you know the secular White House of the United States. I hope that Archbishop uh, Vigano is aware of that. I'm sure I he'll be so. very pleased. <laughs> I hope so. So in two days we saw a nun in full habit wielding a rosary, and the Ave Maria sung from the balcony of the White House. Uh, do you want again for all his flaws? Would you rather have that, or would you rather have the communist Chinese Communist Party and its puppets ruling this country? Right. Well said. Well said. Well, on that note, I think we will close up this special report on the Republican National Convention by praying, speaking of Archbishop Vigano, the prayer that His Excellency composed uh, for a resurgence of Christianity in America and the re-election of President Donald Trump. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, King of kings and Lord of lords, graciously turn your gaze to us who invoke you with confidence. Bless us, citizens of the United States of America. Grant peace and prosperity to our nation. Illuminate those who govern us so that they may commit themselves to the common good in respect for your holy law. Protect those who, defending the inviolable principles of the natural law and your commandments, must face the repeated assaults of the enemy of the human race. Keep in the hearts of your children courage for the truth love for virtue, and perseverance in the midst of trials. Make our families grow in the example that our Lord has given us, together with his most holy mother and Saint Joseph in the home of Nazareth. Give to our fathers and mothers the gift of strength to educate wisely the children with which you have blessed them. Give courage to those who, in spiritual combat, fight the good fight as soldiers of Christ, against the furious forces of the children of darkness. Keep each one of us, O Lord, in your most sacred heart, and above all him whom your providence has placed at the head of our nation. Bless the President of the United States of America, so that, aware of his responsibility and his duties, he may be a knight of justice, a defender of the oppressed, a firm bulwark against your enemies, and a proud supporter of the children of light. Place the United States of America and the whole world under the mantle of the Queen of Victories, our unconquered leader in battle, the Immaculate Conception. It is thanks to her and through your mercy that the hymn of praise rises to you, O Lord from the children whom you have redeemed in the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Well, we hope you enjoyed this special coverage of the RNC convention this week. And uh, if you liked it, please share it, uh, like it on YouTube, send it to your friends. Remember, you can also listen to it and download it in podcast form now as well and share it. Uh, and do tune in. We're going to post uh, right after this a second regular news roundup, be a little bit shorter than this, but covering uh, some important issues that emerged in the church this week. So thank you, and please continue to support our apostolate. Yes, God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Peter, peace, God,